Hello and welcome to the NFDI Talks. I am Elena and I'm working in the NFDI Association's head office. In our NFDI Talks, every two weeks, scientists from different disciplines present exciting topics around research data infrastructure and management. All talks are live streamed and saved on our YouTube channel. Exclusively in Zoom, we invite you to discuss the topics and ask your questions after the presentation. So in this episode, we will talk about a fundamental principle, not only for the national research data infrastructure, but the entire scientific community. We will approach towards the question, what is open science and what is it good for? For that, Monica Gonzalez Marquez will present us the heliocentric model of open science documentation that clearly and quickly explains the goals of open science and provides a basis for implementing it. Monica is an open science manager at Forschungszentrum Jülich, where she teaches researchers open science practice using Helio as a basic premise. She uses her background in linguistics, philosophy of science and experimental psychology to develop evidence-based methods to improve the quality of the scientific record. Welcome, Monica. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. So um, is the YouTube thing going? Okay, fantastic. So then I will go on ahead and get started. I will share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, there we go. So yes, the title of my talk is What is Open Science For? And I will be introducing the heliocentric model of open science documentation. So let's begin where we are now. Um, there is a lot of talk of open science and its goals and what it's supposed to do or what we need to do with it. A lot of this is focused on various tools and infrastructures. Um, several important organizations, such as UNESCO and Kuara, have put out statements um, to indicate what they are trying to accomplish by their mere existence and how they're trying to influence the scientific community. So here are some excerpts. So UNESCO says that the goal is transparency, scrutiny, uh, critique, and reproducibility. Um, I'm not going to read all of it. It's... I, you're not here to listen to me read, um, but the key points are to increase openness, um, to increase transparency and trust in scientific information and reinforce, whoops, sorry, reinforce the fundamental features of science as a distinct form of knowledge. This is lovely. What does it mean? What exactly does it mean in the context of what we as scientists do in our day-to-day -day as we engage in, in, uh, in knowledge discovery and knowledge creation. Kuara does a little bit better, I think. Uh, they say that um, what this is about is uh, quality implies or creating an imp improvement in the scientific quality implies that research is carried out through transparent research processes and methodologies through research management, allowing systematic use of previous results. Once again, this is fantastic. It's a fantastic statement. What does it mean? That said, they go further to talk about how this must involve um, research outputs such as scientific publications, data, software, models, methods, theories, et cetera, all of the different kinds of outputs. Um, and then, of course, when we when we hear talks about open science and the many things that these organizations are, are building and creating, we usually get an image that looks like this, that positions open science at the center. And then we have things like open evaluation or open reviews or open source or open data. All of this is tremendously important and obviously very relevant to what we're trying to accomplish. But the question is, how does this stuff here relate to the stuff here, specifically the things that people do? Or what is the relationship between all of these tool sets and policies and infrastructure we see here associated with open science with this here, the scientific method, the things that we actually do? And this is one of the things that the heliocentric model of open science 
can address directly and very clearly. So before I continue with the model, I do want to make a couple of clarifications. I will begin by saying that the model is descriptive. It describes the transformation that we are experiencing right now from a bird's eye perspective, the transformation from a model of scientific information, documentation, and dissemination that doesn't work very well towards one that is slowly starting to work better. The model is also predictive. It gives us a clear image of where we're going. What exactly does the future look like? Because this is something that is still quite hazy for a lot of people. What are the goals of open science? And a lot of the time, as with the statements that I showed um, right at the beginning, we're left with phrases like that. But what does this actually mean? And this model provides us a picture of what this can look like, of what this will likely look like. Um, I will also say that the model is not prescriptive. It doesn't tell anyone what to do. And it's not proscriptive. It doesn't forbid any practices. Once again, what it does is describe the transformation that we are living through in science as we attempt to improve the quality of the record. So this is Helio, the heliocentric model of um, scientific documentation. So um, it's called Helio because yes, there is a direct conceptual metaphorical relationship to the uh, transition from a geocentric model to a heliocentric model of planetary motion. I won't go into that. There is a preprint that is forthcoming and we do talk about how that happened and what, what the analogy is. Um, but what matters here is that if we imagine that the scientific article is at the center of this planetary system, as the center, it dictates the motion of its satellites. Here, the satellites are the parts of the scientific article, but it's not really about the parts of the scientific article. It's about the information that we need to understand a scientific process. And in this model, the model that we have now, where the scientific article occurs as the currency of science, those things, these, these aspects of the scientific process, their documentation occurs at the mercy and the, within the constraints of the scientific article and the publishing industry. Um, then we have this asteroid belt here. And we like to say that beyond here, there be dragons. And what are the dragons? The things that people don't talk about, the things that the scientific article can't really accommodate. Those are things like code and data. Now, I know that there are some changes in how papers are being published such that they contain links. But what I will emphasize here is that the paper in as it was conceived does not have room to accommodate the minutiae, the details that are involved in a complete scientific process. So what is this model that we're moving towards? That's this model that we see here. And actually, let me advance here. I should have done that. So this is the geocentric model of scientific documentation where the scientific article is at the center. So what happens if we allow research questions, the questions that we ask as scientists to guide what scientific information should be documented and how that information should be structured? So what does that mean precisely? It means understanding what the nature is and what the constraints are of research questions. So here we have this model, which is of a, of a sun of sorts. And at the center of that, the, the hottest part, the red part, actually that's wrong. Anyway, never mind. Um, we have the research question, the research question guiding everything, because everything returns to what we are trying to address with our research question. But the research question doesn't occur in all freedom. It doesn't exist in full freedom. It has constraints. And its first constraint is resources. What resources do we have to actually address any given question? And this is the reason why we write grants, because we need resources of various kinds to be able to conduct any scientific process, to address any, any particular question. If we don't have resources, be they time, be they participants, be they equipment, if you're an astronomer, if you can't get telescope time, you can't answer your question. So this is a very clear um, and delimiting constraint. Immediately following that, we have the communicative drive. Science that is not communicated does not exist. Hence, when we conduct a scientific process, 
we must document it so that others can understand what we did and so that what we did can be connected to other scientific processes. This is communication. Hence, imagine a scientific documentation system where these constraints govern the entire scientific record. This is what we're proposing with the heliocentric model of open science documentation, where we have the scientific process here, the research question, uh, resources, and the communicative uh, drive constraining how we document the various aspects of the scientific process, including analysis, discussion, question background, results. In essence, each of these aspects of the scientific process become their own documentation node because they involve processes that are about themselves, that connect to other processes, but they're very much about themselves. Um, you'll notice that there's a narrative here. This is the paper, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second. So what this means, of course, is that when we conduct methods, we don't do methods. There are various aspects to the labor of doing methods. We have to do a sampling design. We have to do, decide on participant characteristics. This is a model of a human subjects um, study. We have to come up with a model for um, recruitment. We have to decide on what the research method is going to be. We have to test it. These are all satellites that occur as part of the method satellite. In using this particular model that is iterative and nonlinear, it's possible to adapt or very directly adapt the recruitment methods that we developed for this research process in another research process. But because everything is documented separately as its own thing, it's easy to move and adapt to other research process. This is how the system creates open documentation because we take into account every single aspect, every single step of a scientific process and document it independently, not according to the constraints of the research paper, which has space limitations and word limitations and content limitations. Here, these limitations do not exist. The only constraints that exist are about documenting the different steps of the scientific process so that it can be used, so that this information can be used. Okay, so what about the paper? The paper is demoted to serving scientific processes, not constraining their documentation. So this, in fact, means that it assumes the role that it's always played. If you have ever attempted a reproduction of a study or attempted a meta-analysis, the first thing you do is come to understand how grossly underdocumented any process is within the constraints of the scientific paper. What a paper is de facto, is a summary of the things that people did to address a research question. It does not contain enough information for true transparency or for real reproducibility. If you read these papers, and I've read them, and I know many of you have, there is one line that keeps coming up again and again and again. We had to consult the original authors to obtain the details needed to be able to conduct this um, this reproduction. Or with meta analyses, many much of the time you can't even contact the authors. They've left the field. They died. All sorts of things can happen. So that means that that information is missing. That's preventing the um, effective comparison of studies. So let's treat the paper as what it is. It's a summary. It's a summary that must con that that should contain links to all of the real information, the deep information about what researchers did. And so we go back to what is open science for? It's to improve the quality of the scientific record. That is what we are trying to do. And when we're talking about the scientific record, it means that we need to talk about the two major groups that are involved in interacting with the scientific record. It means we need to talk about the users and we need to talk about the producers. So at this point in my talk, I'm moving beyond the theory that we see here. So this is a really nice theoretical model. It's a pretty picture. It looks great, but what does the nitty gritty look like? What does that actually mean? when we reduce things to what the scientific record is actually about. Users, we need to be able to read and understand what other people did. That means that producers 
should be able to document what they did in such a way that we as human beings can understand it. And here I will understand, I will underline that though machine readability is important given the computational age that we're living in, at the end of the day, computational readability, machine readability is not the ultimate goal because who will access that information after it's been machine read is human beings. I, I think some of us are old enough here to remember the old garbage in, garbage out. If we want good usability of scientific information, we must make sure that it is documented in enough detail for humans to be able to understand and use. Hence, this is what we mean when we say that open science is about improving the quality of the scientific record. It means that we are adequately addressing the needs of information users, scientific information users, and that we are accurately addressing the needs of scientific information producers to be able to document usefully, adequately, productively. And um, what about open software, open data, open hardware, et cetera? We will be talking about that shortly, okay? But first, here, I mentioned this term called science reading. Now, it's likely that you've never heard of it. That's okay. Um, this is research that we have done for the past seven, eight years. And this is research on how to teach people to understand basic scientific literature. Um, if you are like most people, and I've talked to literally hundreds of people at this point, if not more, most of us were never taught how to read a scientific paper. Some of us, a few lucky ones, were given a 15-minute lecture on this is the structure of a scientific paper. You have your introduction, your methods, blah, 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 blah. And that was it. Otherwise, we were assigned papers and we were told, go read this paper. We're going to discuss it in seminar next week. So um, what we have done is actually look at the literature on human cognition. How do we understand information and use our knowledge there to develop methods, empirically based methods, evidence based methods, sorry, to teach to understand scientific literature, which brings us to this. What is the purpose of scientific documentation? What is the purpose of the scientific record? The purpose of the scientific record is to make science reading possible. And what is science reading? Science reading is the act of conceptually reconstructing a scientific process from available documentation such that its reliability can be assessed and all of its products used. This is what we should be able to do when we access scientific information, scientific documentation about any given scientific process. What does it mean exactly? It means that we need to understand what was done and observed, why, by whom, how, what it all means, and that enough documentation was created so that we can answer these questions and that all of this documentation is physically and conceptually accessible. Open science has spent a great deal of time and money, oh my God, have we spent money on open access. Open access is nice. Open access involves physical um, access, being able to physically get the paper. That does not mean that you can understand what it contains. That does not mean that the information it contains is sufficient to be able to understand what researchers did. So this means that here, Conceptual accessibility is something that we are still severely lacking in. And this is what science reading um, requires. Are we currently capable of science reading? Well, we know that our studies don't replicate. And if our studies don't replicate, as I mentioned earlier, it's to not a small degree because there isn't enough information available. We're not trying to argue here that the bulk of the science that's out there is bad science. The fact of the matter is that we don't have enough information about how the science was done to be able to judge whether it's good science or bad science. Um, I mean, we can go even further. Some researchers, and Shiel, for example, have argued that we don't even know whether the science that was done addresses the question that people say they were asking because there is insufficient information about how that question was actually addressed. 
In other words, we have a severe underdocumentation crisis in science that we're not talking about enough. <clears throat> the other part, part, of course, is that anyone who's ever read a paper and tried to understand what people did, because you need to understand it to use in your own science, you end up pounding your head against the wall because there isn't enough information there. And then there's peer review. How is it that most of these papers are peer reviewed and they still have these problems, which means that peer review routinely misses these issues in published studies. So are we capable of science reading? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Why? Because papers, do we see this column here? This is the stuff that is typically covered in papers in summary fashion, meaning that it's very, very superficial. In the meantime, this diagram that you see here, so the column that I have here is right here. This is an analysis that we've been working on that outlines all of the different work that is involved in completing every single one of these steps. This is not complete. These are just notes. And it doesn't matter if you can read the notes or not. The point is that you get an image of all of the labor that is erased. And when I talk about labor, I'm talking about the work, the things that people did to address a question. That is the stuff we need transparency about. That is what we need to understand to be able to understand what people did, to be able to evaluate whether the process that they engaged in can effectively address the research question. If we don't have these details, we can't evaluate for reliability. It's, it's, it, you can't evaluate what isn't there. You can assume, but we're not in the business of assuming in science. We claim to be about the facts. These are the facts and they're missing. They're missing in action. Most of the time erased because they were never documented in the first place. Because most labs do not, by far, do not have good documentation practices. And to be fair, it's not their fault. We have not made it our goal to document our science usefully. We've made it our goal to publish papers. And useful scientific documentation and publishing papers are not the same thing. Once again, we all know that what I'm saying is true because you've all been there. Okay, so let's take a step back. What if we considered that science is information about scientific labor and its outcomes? Yes, what we do is labor. And science, the science, because we're, the results without the information about how we got the results is trivia. So we know that the science is what we did. So that is information, information about the work we did. And importantly, that this is information produced by humans for humans with all of their biases and inconsistencies. That means that human beings, not perfect automatons, drones, did the science. That means that there are errors, there are biases, there are all of the Things that mark the human condition are an inherent part of scientific processes because human beings are engaging in scientific processes. And what if we designed and practiced documentation of our labor, thinking about our peers and future generations? Because this is one other thing that we keep forgetting when it comes to the scientific record and open science and the need to improve it. We need to improve it because we need to make this information usable by future generations. That's why we spend billions every single year building the scientific record so that it's a usable tool for now and for future generations. And right now it's not. So if we had these, kept these ideas in mind, what would it mean for scientific documentation? What would it look like? And here we go to um, one of the most personally frustrating parts of the work that we've done here. And um, it's goal-directed problem solving. And we introduced this thing called uh, problem marks. Why is it frustrating? Let's um, begin with this, okay? Um, so you're all familiar with this. It's the scientific method. And I showed you the same diagram uh, a few slides back. We're familiar with it. We know this is what we do, presumably, when we're conducting a scientific study, okay? It so happens that even though we've been told again and again that there's something very, very special about this, about the scientific method, it's actually not that special. It's simply an instantiation of what in cognitive science we call 
goal-directed problem solving. We do this all of the time in every single aspect of our lives since we were babies. We are constantly problem solving. That is what we do. Conducting a research study, a scientific process involves first we have to do this so that we can do that. And once we do that, then we can do that. Every single step, we have to figure out what it is we need to do. What we need to do is a problem to solve. Here, um, I'm assuming that there are some non-native English speakers. So I will clarify that in English, problem doesn't mean something bad. Like I have a headache and that's my problem. A problem is simply something that requires a resolution, a, something that we need to take care of. Um, I need to build a chair for my kitchen. That is a problem to be solved. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned a moment ago, when we conduct a scientific process, we problem solve repeatedly. This is why this little uh, diagram gets repeated again and again and again and again. Because when we make an observation, there are problems that we need to solve to decide whether this is a worthwhile observation to pursue. Then we identify the problem. There are several things that we need to do before we agree that this is a problem, the correct problem to identify. Uh, we research the problem again and again and again. At every step, we engage in problem solving so that we can advance to the next step or steps because science is not necessarily linear. And this is the source of my frustration. We have, so this is just a quick search on Google Scholar. This is over 5 million hits, 5 million. These are hits on what we know of scientists as problem solvers. We have the literature, we have the knowledge to understand how scientists solve problems, how we conduct science. The problem, is that we have neglected to take this literature and adapt it to teach us how to document how we solve those problems. This is imperative because that is in essence what the scientific record should be. It should be documentation of how we solve the different problems involved in a scientific process such that we can say that we reliably address our research question. It's unbelievable when we came across this, we, we were dumbfounded. We did not know that there was such a large literature investigating how scientists solve problems, how scientists do science. Why haven't we adapted these methods to teach us how to document the science that we did so that others can use it? Okay, so what exactly does the scientific problem solving literature imply? It implies these things that we need to conceptualize science for documentation as a series of problems, tasks that need to be solved. And this is how we address our research questions and that we should do this as one problem at a time. We shouldn't do this as methods or analysis as results because these categories are too big. And the fact is that when we're doing an analysis, we don't do an analysis. There's a whole bunch of smaller tasks we need to do as part of completing an analysis. Those little tasks are the things that we need to document. And it also says that we need to describe what is done um, as the work is done, every step of the way. We don't do it after the fact. That whole thing about how humans, how scientists are human and they have all of the frailties of the human condition very much applies here. Our memories fail. We do not remember things correctly. We misinterpret our own memories. Therefore, it's best to document as you go. The key thing, of course, is how, which is forthcoming. Okay, um, so this means that we actually have a pretty good understanding of what the problem solving sequence looks like. And if we interpret it not as, not in terms of describing how people are solving problems, how scientists are solving problems, but to teaching them how to document how they are solving problems, we get a list that looks something like this. We describe the problem. We determine what information we have, information we need. We describe the results we want. What is our goal? Okay. We gather information. What papers, what instructional materials? We think of solutions based on gathered information and prior knowledge. Only we're documenting all of this. Okay. We choose the best solution and create a plan to use it. And we justify it. Uh, we implement solutions 
and document variations on the original plan. We evaluate results and maybe go back to the, to the drawing board. And the important thing here is that we justify every step of the way. Every decision we make, we have to justify. We justify our choices every step of the way. Um, importantly, as I mentioned early on, um, I use my training as a cognitive scientist to improve the quality of the scientific record. So that means that the tools and the methodology that we've been developing uses the human mind and accept it, accepts it as it is, not as a bug in the scientific system, in the purely objective scientific system, which is a myth, but instead accepts the human condition with its constraints as a given, as this is the way it is. So that means that we have a tool set, actually not one, we have several tool sets that allow us to understand and what information we understand and what information we still need. The number one of these is actually something called the universal interrogatives. You may not have heard that term before, that's okay, but you definitely know what they are. They occur in every single human language. And the reason they do that is because they are about finding out what the story is, what the narrative is. So we have two tools here. We have narrative structure, not fiction. I will clarify that right now. When we're talking about narrative structure, we're talking about event structure, the understanding that first this happens, then this happens, and then that and that happens, and then that, 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 and that can happen. This is event structure. And to understand what happens in the context of event structure, we have the universal interrogatives. We need to know who did what, when, where, why, and how every step of the way. If we can answer those questions, we are documenting appropriately. If we can't, we need to go back and do some more writing. Um, and the other key point, of course, is to identify decision points and to justify or motivate your decisions. We are constantly making choices, making decisions as we decide which way we're going to go with the scientific process. We need to justify and motivate those decisions. This is what distinguishes religion from science. So as Sabina Leonelli um, argued so well in her latest book on the philosophy of open science, Without justification for our decisions, we are left with trivia. We are left with religion. This is the foundation of science, that we justify our choices. And then, of course, we don't just have cognitive tools. So right now we've had, we've discussed understanding that science is problem solving. We've discussed understanding um, that uh, science is comprised of events, of a narrative. Um, and then we've discussed also um, the universal interrogatives to help us understand what information we need specifically and what information we st we're still missing. But we also have externalizations. We use external mind. This we, we I should probably talk about that because that's more psychology. But we do depend on external resources uh, to keep track of the stuff that we're doing. So these we call externalizations. So this means doing things like creating spreadsheets to keep track of knowledge sources. The PRISMA guidelines, in case you're not familiar with them, are excellent. They were developed for systematic reviews, but they're excellent to adapt to keep track of the literature you read, where you found it, and to decide whether you're going to use it or not and justify why. Create spreadsheets to keep track of equipment and consumables, including sourcing, model numbers, quantities, et cetera. And of course, as you write your narratives, your descriptions of what you did, include links to all of this information so that people can uh, go to that information as they try to understand what you did. So here's an example of Prisma. I love Prisma. We're actually going to be developing a um, Sotero, I always confuse Sotero with Sonodo, a Sotero plugin that will help researchers keep track of the information within papers or within other documentation um, in, um, right alongside the classical um, bibliographic information, but that's forthcoming. So what does this mean for all of these tools that we were developing in open science or all of these ideas, things like open hardware and open source and open data? It means that in order for them to work effectively, in order to increase the adoption of these tools, they need to be reconceptualized 
as a occurring in, in the service of these different steps of the scientific process. So as we're documenting the different steps of the process, we will need to reach out, for example, to open tools to describe what open tools we used, or we will need to reach out to open evaluation to um, verify that our methods were ver were were were, uh, were documented properly, such that they can be used. So all of these tools that we're using, that we've developed, sorry, that we've developed as part of the open science infrastructure, can best be understood in the context of serving specific nodes, specific steps in the scientific process, not as things unto their, unto themselves. This is one of the problems that people have in understanding what open science is, that they're stuck thinking that it's about open source or open data. Well, you know, I, I, I made my data open, so I'm done with open science. No, because that's not alone. That alone is not going to improve the quality of the scientific record. It's not going to help people understand what you actually did. Open data exists at the service of your method section or your results section, depending on where this data plays a role. So here's the same diagram for analysis. Once again, these are tools at the service of the different steps of the scientific process. Um, finally, here is a schematic of a problem mark documentation. So you begin with problem one and you have a link to resources consulted or software information or your equipment list or your narrative description, which becomes your primary protocol. And then of course that's connected to your secondary protocol and um, your secondary protocol one is necessary so that you can go on to protocol three and two and together you can conduct a secondary protocol four. So, oops. Um, so this creates a an image of how science is actually done that is not linear, but it actually reflects what we do, which is that we don't do things in a linear fashion. And the documentation reflects that. So what you're thinking, this is way too much work. I have no time to do this or for my team to adopt these methods. Um, what about publishing papers? It's going to get in the way of publishing papers or the big one. I don't want to make all of the details of my work public because what if I get scooped? Well, at this point, I will remind you or tell you for the first time if you didn't know, and many of you don't, that open science actually has two steps. First, we document for usability. And this is the part that we need to do a lot more of. Then we can argue about making it open and what parts of it should be open. Keep this in mind. First, we document. And beyond that, why should you consider adoption? Because everything that you do as an output of the science you, that you're doing will be faster if you have good documentation. Imagine writing a dissertation in two months instead of spending a year and two months crying blood tears because you don't remember what you did. Knowledge permanence. This is a big one for PIs. ECRs or early career researchers come and go in your labs. They document badly, which means that when they leave, they take their knowledge with them. That means that the money that you invested in their training or in the work that they did uh, goes with them. You have very little to show for it. If you teach them and if they are taught to document well, you get knowledge permanence. That knowledge stays in your lab. You can use it to continue to develop a better quality science as you go along because you have good records of everything that was done. For um, ECRs, um, you'll have a good documentation of your skill set for future jobs in science and for positions in industry. It is no secret that we have a massive mental health crisis in, in science. Suicide rates are through the roof. We know this. I mean, I think they're second only to medicine. The working conditions are terrible. And one of the things that contributes to this is our sense in science that we don't really know how to do anything. It's massive imposter syndrome. No real understanding of how complex and the level of expertise we possess. But if we document, then we know what we're worth. We know what we can do. And we can do a lot. But it's kind of hard to reach that conclusion if we don't have the evidence. Your documentation of the work you did is your evidence that you're a highly skilled professional with many options in science and outside of um, formal science. More importantly, however, 
you're already doing the work. Document it. Then you have evidence that you did it. So yeah, it's a little bit more work, but it will make other parts of the work that you do for science faster and easier. And if you document it, you know that you did the work and you can get credit for the work that you've done. And I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for your presentation. And with that, uh, we say goodbye on YouTube at this point. In our next episode, in two weeks, we will get to know the basic service PID for NFDI presented by Stephanie Hagemann-Billhold and Philipp Wieder. So I hope to see you there.